starts right now. For the first time in our area, a case of COVID-19 turning deadly. City and county officials confirming today a woman in her 80s died yesterday. She was treated at Brook Army Medical Center and had a history of underlying health issues. The death comes a little more than a week since the first case of COVID-19 was confirmed here in our area. Here are the latest numbers tonight. Metro Health confirming 45 positive cases of COVID-19. 26 are travel related. Seven are close contacts of previously diagnosed people. 10 cases were part of a community spread and two remain under investigation. As we reported, one of those 45 cases did result in death. Another focus is to maximize capacity for COVID-19 patients at hospitals. This includes bed capacity and staffing capacity. And so today I'm issuing two executive orders to expand those capacities. Those executive orders announced this afternoon from the governor included a direction to healthcare professionals to postpone all elective surgeries not deemed medically necessary. That'll keep more beds available for people in need of urgent care. The second order frees up hospital capacity by allowing more than one patient in each room. This comes as the governor announced 334 confirmed cases in the state and six deaths. He added that another 200 more people have received presumptive positive results. There is much more to unpack from Abbott's announcement and you can do so at KSAT.com. We also learned today Senator Rand Paul has tested positive for coronavirus. A statement on Twitter today read, quote, he is feeling fine and is in quarantine. He is asymptomatic and was tested out of an abundance of caution due to his extensive travel and events. He was not aware of any direct contact with any infected person, end quote. The Kentucky Republican is the first U.S. Senator and the third member of Congress now to test positive for the virus. According to Paul's deputy chief of staff, the senator expects to be back in the Senate after his quarantine period ends. We'll have much more on coronavirus coming up in just a bit. But first, an update to a story we've been following since yesterday afternoon. A man is still recovering in the hospital tonight after police say a driver shot him three times in Alamo Plaza. Yeah, that driver was arrested and Bear County officials have now identified him as 69 year old Oscar Gonzalez Perez. The night team's Jaffney Gray spoke to the victim's wife, who says she was standing with her husband when he was shot. We were turning and the guy says, F you. You too. It was an afternoon turned deadly for Crystal David and her husband, 32 year old Cipriano David. Crystal says the two were allegedly cut off by a driver as they were crossing a crosswalk in Alamo Plaza. San Antonio police have identified that driver is 69 year old Oscar Perez. Crystal says Perez drove off, but they ran into him again shortly afterwards. When we got to the bus stop, that's when my husband is like, is that the car? Is that the car? I say, yes, that's the car. And he went over there and kicked the car. Crystal says she and her husband have been homeless for two years. Her husband suffers from a bipolar disorder. She says she tried to calm him down, but it was too late. He was shot three times. When you're talking to it about his wife or anything like that, that's when the stripper is going to kick him. Mm -hmm. But other than that, he's pretty laid back. He's pretty quiet. Cipriano's younger sister, Jennifer David, said she had just talked to him. He was hungry, and I told him, we'll just go to my house just to get some soups and stuff like that. The alleged shooter, Perez, told police that Cipriano was aggressively panhandling and that he shot him after Cipriano hit his window and began kicking his car. However, Crystal says they have never panhandled. He has a punctured lung. He has a shattered elbow. Jennifer says she hopes her brother learns to walk away from confrontations and she wants this incident to serve as a lesson to others. Now, a lot of people just want to fight with violence and it's not the answer to everything. A Cipriano is in stable condition and his family says he's expected to be released from the hospital in about a week. Again, Perez is being charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. He has since bonded out of jail on a $40,000 bond. Jaffney Gray, KSAT 12 News. Bear County budget employees tee off on one of the county's senior leaders and it was all caught on tape. Tommy Calvert is the voice of reason. It is just more evidence of what Commissioner Calvert himself calls a budget department that's out of control. The night team's Dylan Collier has the audio in tonight's Defenders investigation. Discussion. 
Precinct 4 Commissioner Tommy Calvert is the first African-American commissioner in Bear County history. This is the National Bar Association. And, and his work in public service. Here in Sudan, one of the poorest countries in the world. Including extensive efforts to combat human trafficking in the Sudan was well documented long before Calvert was elected, which makes the following conversation involving Bear County budget employees even more bizarre. But no, that's exactly it. He hasn't been alive long enough to do half the shit he's going to do with that. But that's why I want to like keep a list and be like, if I get to like 20 items, I'd be like, what, did you have all these jobs for six whole months? <laughs> yeah, because he's only like 30 something. Did you work for a temp agency? He doesn't have the time. <laughs> <laughs> the audio was captured on a cell phone by a budget employee in January as a group of co-workers gathered for a meeting on the ninth floor of the Paul Elizondo Tower. Multiple employees have identified the voices heard on the recordings as belonging to budget analyst Thomas De Caesar and senior budget analyst Paul Mady, heard here again tearing apart Calvert's work history. This is not enough time for him to have done any of these things to any amount of expertise, right? And his fallback when he doesn't have work experience, he's blah, blah, it's in my, it's in my precinct. <laughs> like, that makes him a deity that knows everything about precinct four. Like, uh, yes, it's in my precinct. Clearly, I'm the subject matter expert. How can county staff members talk about a commissioner this way? You know, there needs to be some cl cleaning of house. Um, this is not um, just about the commissioners and myself, uh, but this is about an attitude of public servants and respect for the voters who sent me to represent them. How many employees do you anticipate this particular contract would require? And there's more. While talking about Calvert's role in this December commissioner's discussion on the jail commissary contract, Mady hurled this insult. If Tommy Calvert is the voice of reason, When asked for a comment from budget leaders, county officials responded by asking us to hand over the raw audio files. We declined and instead caught up to De Caesar as he left the office for the weekend. Excuse me, Thomas. Hi. Dealing with KSAT 12? Yeah, hi. I'm Here. on the phone. Right okay, now. we just will take 30 seconds. Day uh, Caesar was yeah. kind enough to wait. speak with us for a few moments, and after at first denying taking part in the conversation, he offered a semi-apology to Commissioner Calvert. I don't, do you apologize for what you said about him? I mean, he's a county commissioner, and you and Paul basically took him to task. I mean, I don't recall saying anything like that. If I did, it wasn't my intention to cause any, you know, harm or anything like that, but... For the Defenders, like Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. Good luck. Mady and Bear County Budget Director Seth McCabe declined our interview request. County Manager David Smith told us simply, thank you, Dylan, for bringing this to our attention. We will be looking into this matter. You can read or you can hear the entire recordings in their entirety right now at ksat.com. Accusations of price gouging have launched an investigation into a local grocery store on the city's south side. Photos online show a price increase in store items at Thrift Team Mart. Those photos generating many questions and concerns online. The night team Stephen Cavasso spoke with the store owner today who is addressing those claims against his business. Items flying off the shelves as customer demand grows. But Juan Cañedo, the owner and manager of Thrifty Mart, says despite this, he still wants to make sure they have what they need. I see the desperation in people. I see that they're scared. The store located off Zazamora has not been able to stock their shelves with certain items like eggs, milk, and tissue paper from traditional vendors. Cañedo forced to find an alternative to keep business going. But in doing so, the store was accused of price gouging. That was very hurtful because uh, all we try to do is take care of our customers. Invoices show the store purchased inventory from non-traditional vendors who don't normally provide items sold at the store, which is why the price was higher. Toilet paper rolls this size are what's typically sold here at Thrifty Mart, but because of recent demands, this is what they've had to sell to customers, which is why the price has changed. The store marked up price to continue profiting, but according to the store's attorney, their retail margins have stayed the same. Ganiedo says the store, which has been open more than 50 years, has never been faced with something like this. Today, I couldn't take care of my customers. I had to address these allegations. But he says for now, the store will stay open, and in a time of uncertainty, they'll continue to serve the community. We wanted to take care of our customers. No, we wanted to take care of our neighbors. 
Now, an attorney with Thrifty Mart says that an investigator with the Southwest Texas Infusion Center assured Ganedo that his paperwork disputes any claims of price gouging. However, that investigation is still ongoing. We'll be sure to bring you the results of the investigation once it's completed. However, the Better Business Bureau notes that if anyone suspects price gouging to report it properly, they can do so by reaching out to the Texas Attorney General's office, BCSO, or even filing a complaint against that business with the Better Business Bureau. For now, reporting live, Stephen Cavazos, KSAT 12 News. Tim, Courtney. Thank you, Stephen. In Dallas County tonight, a big shape up, shake up to everyday life coming in the form of a countywide shelter in place order. Dallas County Judge Clay Jenkins issued the order today following the deaths of two more people. It goes into effect tonight at 1159 p.m. and lasts through April 3rd, with the likelihood of it being extended. It allows for people to still leave their homes for activities deemed essential. Those include getting supplies for themselves, their families, or to perform tasks deemed necessary to their health and safety. Only essential businesses like health care, critical infrastructure, and retail, including grocery stores, are allowed to operate. Tonight, the city of New Braunfels is adding to the list of closures. At first, bars, restaurant dining rooms, gyms, movie theaters, bowling alleys, and indoor amusement facilities were ordered to close. Now, the city of New Braunfels is ordering the shutdown of all non-medical or personal services that cannot be provided while maintaining a six feet distance. That includes nail and hair salons, barber shops, beauty salons, spas, massage parlors, tattoo and piercing parlors, and private clubs. The establishments that are still allowed to stay open, like grocery stores and pharmacies, must require customers to stand six feet apart, both inside and outside of the establishment. The order is set to go into effect at 11.59 tonight. The New Braunfels mayor, Baron Castile, called it a wise step in the protection of the community. Joint Base San Antonio Lackland continues to ramp up safety precautions amid more positive COVID-19 cases there. The base now limiting gate access and is asking drivers to approach all gates with windows closed. IDs will be scanned through the window before entry. Some delays are expected as a result of the change. This as two additional people at JBSA have been infected by the coronavirus, bringing the total now at the base to 13. Officials with JBSA say a contact tracing investigation is now underway. Some of San Antonio's local nonprofits have teamed up against coronavirus. The San Antonio Area Foundation, along with the United Way of San Antonio, the city and Bear County will use their new COVID-19 response fund to help support local nonprofits that are being hit hardest by this pandemic. The fund is valued at more than $2.7 million. The Area Foundation is hosting the fund, waiving administrative fees and encouraging businesses and philanthropic partners to join in helping these nonprofits recover. You can find more information about this initiative right now at ksat.com. Here's a story of community creativity. Gateway Fellowship Church has figured out a way to have Sunday service while protecting its congregation from COVID-19. With the help of three cameras, dozens of cables, and a radio dial, the church created its first drive-in church service. Just like a drive-in movie, cars are ushered into a spot in the parking lot and told to tune in. Those in attendance say they're glad the church was able to make, make these accommodations. It's also sweet to see other people come around and um, want to experience the same thing and um, still have community while being safe. People miss one another, you know, we need community. And so it's really exciting that we have this opportunity to do it. Church officials say for now they plan to continue having services like this while they abide by local and state regulations. And I'm glad to see that today's drizzle did not uh, stop that church service this morning. Glad those folks were able to gather in some way. Look outside tonight. Man, it has been a messy weekend. We were hoping for a few peaks of sun this afternoon. That really was not the case. And that has kept us in the 60s this afternoon. So 50s yesterday. 60s today we will get closer to 80 tomorrow, but we are not done warming up. It is going to be awfully toasty as we head into this week. We'll get a taste of some early summer like weather coming up here in just a couple of days out there. Now though, 63, I don't think we're going to cool off a whole lot more than where we are right now. We've got some fog out there. Drizzle continues, so it would be a messy night, but the sun returns tomorrow and then we warm up a lot to talk about in the forecast that's coming up in just a bit. Tim. Thank you, Katie. Our coronavirus coverage continues tonight. Several states now named disaster areas in the midst of a pandemic and up next FEMA and several big businesses now responding to a shortage of medical supplies.
FEMA reporting masks discussed at a briefing yesterday are already being distributed and supplies are being shipped from the national stockpile. This is hospitals around the country express concerns about having beds and supplies. ABC's Marcy Gonzalez with the story. As the number of confirmed novel coronavirus cases increases, so too does concern about a shortage of supplies in hospitals across the country. We can't do some of the kind of more common life-saving things we normally do in the emergency department, like intubation, um, CPR, other things, without a significant risk to us healthcare workers. An internal memo from a doctor at New York Presbyterian Hospital saying they're now going through 40,000 and 95 masks a day. That's 10 times more than usual and expecting that number to go up significantly in the next few weeks. Officials in that hard hit state purchasing more than 2 million new masks and 6,000 ventilators, but more are urgently needed there and nationwide. If we don't get the equipment, uh, we can lose lives that we could have otherwise saved if we had the right equipment. On ABC's This Week, FEMA Administrator Peter Gaynor saying masks are being sent where they're needed. They're shipping today, they've shipped yesterday, they're shipped tomorrow. And I think what, one of the things... When uh, you say they, we, we what can, do you mean? How many? Which masks? The new masks? Well, I mean, I, I can't give you the details about what every single state or what every single city's doing, but, but I'm telling you that we are shipping from our national stockpile, we're shipping from vendors, uh, we're shipping from donations. Businesses now stepping up to help meet the demand. Apple sending millions of N95s to hospitals. Haynes now making masks as well. And President Trump tweeting today, Ford, General Motors and Tesla are being given the go ahead to make ventilators and other metal products fast. Marcy Gonzalez, ABC News, Los Angeles. And as the U.S. struggles to deal with a supply shortage, a warning from overseas, a dozen physicians at the epicenter of Italy's COVID-19 outbreak making a dramatic plea to the rest of the world, warning that medical practices during a pandemic may need to be changed with care delivered to many patients at home. We were hoping to see a little bit of the sunshine today. Unfortunately, that... Do you hear that music wow. or is that just in my head? No, it's not in okay. your head. All right, never know. It's changing to like a happy tone. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're transitioning to the weather. <laughs> yeah. we Katie to makes sunshine. us happy. <laughs> Smooth transition. Uh, I probably would have made some folks a little happier today if we could have gotten some sunshine going. I was hopeful we'd see some peaks of sun this afternoon. That wasn't to be, but tomorrow we should see some clearing faster and that'll help to warm us up. And I want to give you a look at the week ahead in kind of a unique perspective. So Justin Horn put this graphic together last week. The social distancing lawn mowing forecast, which I love. And it doesn't just have to be lawn mowing. It can be anything your yard needs, working with your garden, getting getting the kids outside for a little bit. But uh, it's going to be good weather all week long to uh, get out and take care of the yard. We don't have any chances of rain in the forecast. I think the only thing that may bother you is that it's going to get pretty toasty here over the next couple of days. Temperatures today generally limited to the 60s. That's where most of us were stuck today under that deck of clouds. High temperature in San Antonio 64 got up to 73 in Del Rio and we had some folks in the 70s, even low 80s down closer to the coast as clouds cleared out off to the west and to the southeast. But most of us stuck under gray skies and drizzle today. So our high temperature was 64. We've only fallen down to 63. That's what those low clouds, higher humidity will do for you. There's just not a lot of room for temperatures to budge. Low to mid 70s down closer to the coast and it's in the low 60s up in the hill country right now. Winds are calm for most of us. That's what that CM means. So calm all along the I-35 corridor. But if you look down closer to the coast, winds are starting to become a bit more southerly. There's also a good little breeze there down near Victoria and everyone will see a south wind settle in over night tonight through early tomorrow morning. That's where the higher dew point numbers are as well, where we've got that steady south wind. Dew points are in the low 70s, so into the oppressive range there as far as humidity is concerned. But really all of us have dew points in the 60s, a few upper 50s off to the northwest. So it's feeling a uh, very muggy out there and we've got the drizzle. Just not a pleasant day, that's for sure. A uh, fog hasn't been a huge issue today. We haven't totally cleared up the fog that developed late last night and was around through this morning. Three mile visibility here in San Antonio two and a half miles from Kerrville to New Braunfels. I do anticipate fog becoming a bit more widespread and even a little dense through the start of the day tomorrow. So fog and drizzle in the forecast overnight. Low temperature of 63, so I don't see us cooling down from where we are right now with a 20% chance of a spotty little shower, especially through dawn tomorrow morning. More clearing is expected and 
faster tomorrow afternoon. That will uh, give way to way more sunshine and high temperatures in the upper 70s and low 80s for your Monday afternoon. There are your southerly winds really settling back in tomorrow at about 5 to 15 miles per hour. So we will have a little breeze here or there. There's plenty of cloud cover all across South Texas, but any rain that's heavy enough to be picked up on radar, that's generally east of the I-35 corridor. We do have some very, very light showers from Wilson County through Nixon up to Gonzales and approaching the Highway 90 and I-10 corridors now as well. Not picking up on any of that shower activity in and around San Antonio, but certainly a few heavier showers. Heavier is not even the right term. We have the drizzle going, but there may be a couple of isolated spotty showers uh, that will be possible for the next several hours as we get into the overnight hours. So future cash shows everyone waking up tomorrow morning with more gray skies fog and drizzle in the forecast, but then clearing up very nicely into tomorrow afternoon. We won't see completely crystal clear blue skies tomorrow. There will be some lingering clouds into the second half of the day, but definitely more clearing than what we saw this afternoon. So that'll put your high temperatures for most of us tomorrow near 80 degrees. A few mid to upper 70s there in the hill country. If you're well to the south, you could even start to flirt with that 90 degree mark tomorrow afternoon. But here in San Antonio, a high temperature in the low 80s. We get into Tuesday and Wednesday, even Thursday. We're seeing a ton of sunshine and look at these high temperatures, upper 80s, low 90s. So we won't break records this week, but it'll be unseasonably hot as we get into the next several days. Uh, that's all due to a weather pattern change. We'll talk more about that change and uh, what next weekend is looking like behind a weak cool front coming up next half hour. Guys. Personally, I think all of your weather forecasts should have music underneath. I think now. so too. There's <laughs> apparently an explanation for it we're about to get when we go to this. <laughs> I think that's our new thing though. We'll be right back. <laughs> All of the major sports may be on hold as far as games and competitions are concerned, but the NFL is in business when it comes to free agency and making big headlines. Let's check in with our Greg Simmons to find out what's on Instant Replay. Yeah, lucky for us, they're still competing, but off the field right, right now. And where do the Dallas Cowboys and the Houston Texans wind up when it comes to trades and signings during the offseason? Coming up tonight on a brand new edition of Instant Replay. He said, he told DeAndre Hopkins, he said, hey, uh, the last time I had to have a meeting like this, it was with Aaron Hernandez. Michael Irvin fanning the flames of the most controversial trade in the history of the Houston, Texas. As head coach and now general manager Bill O'Brien sends their star wide receiver DeAndre Hopkins to the Arizona Cardinals in exchange for running back David Johnson and a few picks. And it's not going over well with Texan fans. The Cowboys may have been able to keep Dak Prescott and Amari Cooper, but they've lost a ton of defensive stars to free agency from cornerback Byron Jones to pass rusher Robert Quinn. Who did they sign in return? Just out of respect to everything that he's accomplished and everything that he's done, you know, I, I would kind of have to defer to him. Yeah. You know, he's, he, he's he's the GOAT, you know. All right, giving up your number 12 for your new quarterback is always a good move. Tom Brady is another shocker in the NFL offseason as he leaves New England Patriots, where he led the patch to six Super Bowl titles in 20 years, is now a Tampa Bay Buccaneer. We'll have the latest on that, plus the future Canelo Alvarez in the ring as all the major sports are on hold right now. This is how Patty Mills is spending some of his unexpected free time now that the NBA is on hiatus. How much longer can we expect the NBA and other leagues to stay dark? And when they resume, how will they continue? Should they delay the start of the NBA season until Christmas next season? And is the league getting preferential treatment when it comes to COVID-19 testing? All that plus, we look back at the first live interview in the history of Instant Replay. And what was the biggest surprise in the NFL offseason tonight? You decide. Instant Replay is live and it's after the night. So, so far, plenty to talk about. Plenty to talk about in the musical interlude we heard going into weather was a little sneak peek at uh, Patty's. Ah, a little tease. Yes, Thank you. We'll have to turn <laughs> in and see the rest. All right, thanks, Greg. Next on the night, be potential economic relief amid the coronavirus crisis could come in the form of a new stimulus package. A look at what's expected tomorrow on Capitol Hill. The White House making assurances help is on the way as the country deals with the coronavirus pandemic. Yeah, two states hit hard by the virus already declared disaster areas and California may be next. Here's ABC's Mona Kosar Abdi with the details. President Trump and his White House Coronavirus Task Force assuring Americans help is on the way to states and communities in desperate need of money and supplies. The federal government has deployed hundreds of tons of supplies from our national stockpile to locations with the greatest need. 
in order to assist in those areas. The president reminding Americans they can help stop the spread of the virus. It is absolutely critical that Americans continue to follow the federal government's guidelines. So important about social distancing, non-essential travel, and hand washing. But there continues to be examples of Americans ignoring that advice. Crowded beaches in California, boat parties in Florida, and this video taken yesterday showing a crowded New York City park. I don't know what I'm saying that people don't get. I don't know what they're not understanding. This is not life as usual. The president declaring the states where the outbreak is most severe here in the U.S. Disaster areas, New York, Sunday adding Washington and California. We have medical supplies en route to these states, including respirators, surgical masks, gowns, face shield, coveralls, gloves. With personal protective equipment desperately needed in healthcare facilities across the country, 3M says it has doubled production and will be sending half a million N95 respirators to hospitals in New York City and Seattle. And as medical centers continue to struggle, so are American workers with millions of people now ordered to stay at home. Many businesses are shuttered, lawmakers in Washington working out a massive stimulus package. The price tag on that bill could be at least $2 trillion. If or when the Senate will vote on that bill is still unclear. Monaco Sarabdi, ABC News, New York. As the coronavirus threatens all aspects of daily life around the world, healthcare workers continue their work on the front lines. Spain has been one of the worst hit countries, but each night in cities around the nation, thousands of Spaniards go to their windows and balconies to applaud the enormous sacrifice those health care workers are making each and every day. Meanwhile, here in the U.S., all boat ramps and marinas in Miami-Dade County, Florida, are closed until further notice. As mentioned earlier, video shows hundreds of boats partying at an inlet on Saturday. Miami Mayor Carlos Jimenez announced the closures last night after learning about a flyer going around inviting people to a sandbar party. The closure doesn't affect commercial fishermen providing food to restaurants and markets. Jimenez says police will be patrolling the waters and ramping up enforcement of his order. In past natural disasters, Anheuser-Busch has switched from producing beer to drinkable water. During this current pandemic, the brewery says it will be distributing bottles of hand sanitizer around the U.S. A post on the company's Facebook page says, We have a long history of supporting our communities and employees. This time is no different. The company also says it will use one of its Brazil beer breweries to produce half a million sanitizer bottles for public hospitals. The annual White House Correspondents' Dinner will be postponed due to the coronavirus. Originally scheduled for April 25th, the Correspondents' Association says it will release an alternative date later. The event is a chance for journalists to socialize and raise money for scholarships. It's also a venue for comedy. The dinner was set to return to that tradition this year. That's after President Trump took offense to jokes about him made at the dinner two years ago. Olympic organizers say they're stepping up scenario playing for the 2020 Games in light of the pandemic. The International Olympic Committee Executive Board is debating a postponement of the Games, but not a full cancellation. One consideration is the availability of Tokyo venues at a later date. Organizers are also looking into whether Olympics can start in July as planned, but with a modified operational strategy. They say they want to be fair to the athletes who've spent years of training for the Games and to ticket holders who already paid for their trips. Hundreds of GameStop stores across the U.S. are temporarily closing amid backlash. Some stores for the video game retailer stayed open even after orders for non-essential retail to close. GameStop had argued it is essential because it sells computer equipment to help people work from home. However, some employees said such equipment is only sold in select stores. Several employees also accused the retailer of trying to profit off a spike in video game shopping during the pandemic. GameStop says now it will shift to online sales and curbside pickup orders only. Look outside with live cam after what has been a cloudy, drizzly, damp, and very cool weekend. We've got some big changes on the way soon, as is usually the case here in South Texas, right? We turn things around on you pretty quickly. It is very humid out there right now. Humidity is at 97%. We've got calm winds. That is a perfect recipe for some fog to develop. It's fairly patchy at the moment, but I am thinking we could have some widespread fog and dense in spots develop through early tomorrow morning. Right now, dense fog advisory are only out for northeast Texas, part of central Texas as well.
well. A little closer to Austin, so no dense fog advisories for our area as of now, but that could certainly change through early tomorrow morning. So uh, if you will be up early in the morning, have to get out, run a few errands or something like that, uh, head to uh, head to the store. Just make sure you check in with Justin Horn. He'll be on GMSA in the morning because we certainly uh, could have another messy start to the day tomorrow. We'll talk more about a big warm up heading our way coming up. Tim. Thank you, Katie. Flattening the curve. Surely you've heard this phrase in recent weeks, but what does it mean and how does it affect you? We'll explain next. By now, you have probably heard the term flattening the curve when it comes to fighting the coronavirus. RJ Marquez explains what exactly that means and why it's so critical to our health care system. It's part of a series called Understand, which airs on the news at nine. <laughs> When it comes to the novel coronavirus, one of the biggest uncertainties is how much faster it will spread in the U.S. This is where flattening the curve comes in. The speed of the outbreak is critical to combating the disease, which is why mass gatherings have been canceled, schools have been closed, and we have been asked to stay at home if possible. It's all in an effort to do what's known as social distancing. If there is a massive spike in cases, experts say it will overwhelm our healthcare system. More people will die because there won't be enough hospital beds and ventilators to keep them alive. The curve takes into account the daily number of cases and the capacity of our healthcare system. If we do not social distance and take preventative measures, the daily outbreak peak will explode. If we act now and take precautions, the peak could flatten out over time. Yes, simply slowing the spread of COVID-19 extends its time, but it would prevent flooding the healthcare system, which is more of an urgent concern. Hospitals would be better equipped to treat several people over an extended period of time, as opposed to a rush of patients in a shorter period. Keep in mind, flattening the curve does not essentially reduce the number of overall cases we will see, but health experts say the goal is not so much about preventing illness, but rather slowing down the rate at which people get sick. This could save lives. Even if you're young and healthy or feeling okay, it's your job to social distance to avoid spreading it to others and keep the pandemic in slow motion. I'm RJ Marcus. To see more stories like this, watch Case at News at 9, Monday through Friday. Children complaining they have nothing to do while stuck indoors? After the break, how your child can try their hand at being a meteorologist from home. Be right back. Well, hey, parents and kids. I know school is canceled and you may be stuck in a bit of a learning rut. We came up with a way for you to be a meteorologist in your own backyard. Let's start by learning to identify the different types of clouds. Here at KSAT, we created a KSAT 12 cloud handbook. All you have to do is follow the flow chart and you'll find out what the cloud is in the air. So let's follow this cl uh, flow chart. Clouds, they're pretty low and they're pretty long and smooth. So guess what? It's stratus clouds. Boop, boop, boop. Hey, you can download this and uh, try your hand at it too. For more activities and other lessons you can do at home, check out the KSAT Kids page on KSAT.com. Keeping those kids busy and now a full-time job. Fortunately, a lot of those kids are going to start getting their schoolwork sent home. Yeah, I know. Week. You won't be complaining you're bored anymore, right, at home once you have to start <laughs> the, the school. The full-on teaching now. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah, we, uh, we've we been working to get some more content on that KSAT Kids page. I recorded a new Be a Meteorologist at Home video tonight. Justin Horn did one a couple days ago. We've got Adam Kasky's How to Build a Homemade Thermometer on there as well, so go and check it out. You saw the pollen count earlier in the show, but I wanted to touch on something. So, oak is still high today. Uh, and we know why mold is high, right? Because it's been so damp and humidity has been high and that typically keeps the mold count high. That's no surprise. Oak's still high though. Uh, but you got to remember, think back to two days ago on Friday, the oak count was over 2000. So in comparison, 730, not so bad. So the rain that's moved through while it has increased the mold count, it has helped to wash out some of the oak and hopefully that number will fall even more tomorrow and we'll catch a little bit of a break over the next few days. Uh, here's the drought monitor. This came out last Thursday. We'll get an updated version this Thursday, and hopefully 
it'll look pretty good because we've got a big swath of red here, generally south of Highway 90, but from Gonzales there uh, down to the south and over to Maverick County where there is extreme drought across South Texas. And I'm going to overlay uh, estimated rainfall over the past three days, 72 hours, and a nice swath here did hit some of that extreme uh, drought area there to the southeast of San Antonio. We even had a nice little swath of uh, more than two inches of rain up through a portion of the hill country. So the rain we got over the past several days was very, very beneficial, made for some nice reading and bench watching weather this weekend. But things are really changing in the forecast. Our overall weather pattern is going to change this week. And look what I've got for you. Last Sunday, I was showing you several days of rain chances. This Sunday, um, no rain in the forecast this week, aside from maybe a little bit of morning drizzle tomorrow. Temperatures now low 70s down closer to the coast. 65 New Braunfels, 66 out in Del Rio. And I think temperatures are going to hold pretty steady overnight. They may drop a couple more degrees, but not by much because we've got cloudy skies that typically keeps temperatures from moving a whole lot. We've also got high humidity in place. That's going to keep temperatures holding steady, but that is also going to allow for some fog to develop. Visibility down to two miles in Gonzales, three miles in New Braunfels, and here in San Antonio. Places well to the south and off to the west. You were just fine as far as visibility is concerned as of now, but I do expect fog to become more widespread and dense in spots after midnight and through early tomorrow morning. So it is going to stay very messy out there overnight through early on Monday with that fog and drizzle hanging around through midday. Tomorrow we'll start to see that fog go away. The drizzle let up as well. Still mostly cloudy by lunchtime, but then more clearing tomorrow afternoon. We'll see those clouds uh, clear out faster than they did today. That'll put our afternoon high temperature near 80 degrees. Southerly wind settling in tomorrow. A little breezy at times, 5 to 15 miles per hour. And here comes that big weather pattern change. Our overall weather pattern is really going to shift. So last week we had several upper level lows moving in from the west that kept rain chances in the forecast. Uh, as we get into this week, though, upper level high pressure moving in from the south. This typically keeps us fairly sunny, rain free and also much warmer. So those upper level lows that bring us chances of rain not going to be able to impact our forecast here in South Texas. It won't be until the start of next weekend that that will start to weaken and move away. Another low pressure system moving in from the west will actually Looks like it will bring in a cool front for us for next weekend to bring our temperatures back down closer to where they should be this time of year. In the meantime, get ready for some sunny days and some very warm afternoons this week. Guys, early taste of summer. Thank you, Katie. As we head into the break, we just want to give you an update on some breaking news. Guadalupe County is reporting its second COVID-19 case. The individual is experiencing mild symptoms and isolating at home. That's according to the news release we got. Yeah, officials said there is a risk of exposure for people who went to the HEB located at 17460 I-35 North in shirts between 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. on Monday, March 16th. That's according to the news release. We have a full article on this right now on KSAT.com, so you can read more about it. We'll be right back. Unable to defend their national title due to the cancellation of sports by spring sports by the NCAA, how did the Texas Lutheran University Bulldogs send off their women's softball team? Basically all sports. And he was our first interview on Instant Replay in 1993. And tonight we bring back the Admiral David Robinson for an encore performance 27 years later. Let's find out what else is on Instant Replay with Craig Simmons. Back in the day, a lot more hair, a little darker. <laughs> we'll see how that goes for us. And over the years, what has March brought us that we can celebrate in sports tonight? A look at those miles stones coming up tonight on a brand new edition of instant replay what has john lucas meant to this team I, and i don't mean for you to have to compare him against jerry tarkanian because they're just two t different types of coaching styles what has he personally meant to this team yeah they're really very different uh, john the is, uh, admiral david robinson was our first guest on our debut of instant replay on march the 14th 1993 now 27 years later we relive the big moment in local sports broadcasting with an encore performance and that's not the only March anniversary we revisit tonight, including the retirement ceremonies for the Memorial Day miracle maker Sean Elliott, three-time NBA champion Bruce Bowen, and junior himself Johnny Moore, who had his NBA career cut short due to desert fever. And who can forget Shaquille O'Neal leading the Cole Cougars to an undefeated season and the state championship title 31 years ago. Um, it didn't seem like we were going to be done completely, um, and it seemed like we were still going to have some time with each other left, and um, it ended up being, you know, that weekend we played was our last weekend. 
The Texas Lutheran Bulldogs won't have a chance to defend their national championship in college softball this year, but the university figured out a way to give the seniors a big send-off just before the suspension of all spring sports went into effect. Our Andrew Seeley traveled to Seguin for that story. And while Major League and Minor League Baseball is on hold, the show must go on when it comes to maintaining the condition of the field. Our Andrew Seeley also checks in on the mission's groundskeepers who are keeping the field ready for opening day, whenever that may be. And one of the sports that has been allowed to continue is golf. Our Jessica Hunt will take you to the links to find out who's giving it a swing. All that plus the biggest surprise in the NFL offseason and who was the starting quarterback for the then San Antonio Riders 29 years ago this March. We'll show you instant replay is live and it's next a little trip down memory lane tonight. You and David have aged very well. <laughs> That's nice of you to say. Thanks, Greg. We'll be right back.